Welcome to the Borderless Podcast, your guide to traveling, investing, and living beyond borders, where we talk about living the life that you want to live where you want to live it. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Borderless Podcast. This is your host, James Guzman. Thanks again for joining me. Uh, Today, I'm going to play an interview that I had with Bobby Casey. A lot of people know Bobby Casey. He's really big in the uh, offshore banking world. Uh, He knows a lot about investments and all kinds of different asset classes and things like that. So I think we had a great conversation. Uh, We kind of went all over the place, but uh, I hope that you'll find it interesting. And uh, there are no reviews for me to read this time. So, you know, please give me some reviews. If you enjoy the podcast, then please go to iTunes and put a review on there and I will read it on the next episode. And I hope that you're enjoying it. Uh, I hope that, uh, you know, you've been learning some things uh, from listening to the podcast and following the blog and the YouTube channel. Uh, If you're not on the mailing list, then I need you to go to the mailing list, borderlessblog.com. Sign up on the mailing list. That's where you're going to get all updates and other things. It's not just a podcast. I've got other things uh, that I send out to people and also when I appear on other people's shows and stuff like that. So if you want to stay in the loop, then please, please go over there. It's free and uh, check that out. And uh, when you're on there and uh, you, you know, feel free to uh, reach out, respond to one of the podcasts if you have an opinion about something or if you want to have somebody on or something like that, let me know. Info at borderlessblog.com. And of course, I wanted to mention the sponsor for the podcast, and that is My Retirement Rehab. Uh, Ian Bond has worked in the finance industry for decades, and he has now put together a what's called the No Nest Egg Retirement Plan, and he's going to help people that are right reaching retirement. Maybe they don't have the uh, financial backing that they thought they would. Maybe the, uh, you know, the situation has changed a bit and they are afraid that they're going to be working for the rest of your life, their lives. And the thing is you can't work for the rest of your lives. Uh, Everybody gets older and that's just not an option. So well, what can you do? Well, he has put together a program uh, where he can help you use some of uh, the the assets that are available to people today, maybe some alternative types of investments, and also how to lower your own budget. And he goes through lots of different strategies, and uh, he's put together a community here, as well as a bunch of uh, videos and things like that. And he will help you uh, get through that. So check that out. It's in the a link in the description. Uh, definitely go there and you're going to get in on the ground floor uh, of, of this thing because he's putting it together. He's you know, found a way to secure his own retirement and um, he's going to you know, be helping other people uh, from now on. That's what he wants to do. So let him, let Ian Bond help you. Go to the link and uh, check out Retirement Rehab. All right. That's all I got for you today, so I think that you'll really enjoy this interview, and uh, here goes. Borderless. All right, everybody, welcome to another Borderless Podcast, and today I got on Bobby Casey. We spent about three years, and uh, it's good talking to you again. How you doing, Bobby? Hey, man, how's it going? Good to, good to be back. Absolutely, be- absolutely. You know, you are a, a, a popular guest. People always like to hear your opinion on stuff. You know, Bobby knows... He's all going all over the world. He's involved in all kinds of investments as far as uh, crypto and uh, real estate and e-commerce stuff and um, knows about all these different places as far as location-dependent living and being an expat. And so you're right up uh, the alley of what we talk here at uh, the Borderless Podcast. And um, so we were just talking about kind of the economy in general. I mean, there's a lot of people that have thought that um, – because of Trump getting elected and, you know, we've seen the stock market going up and then actually, you know, lately uh, it's been really not doing so great. Um, but, you know, a lot of people are thinking that this is going to kind of turn everything around and uh, maybe, you know, the states isn't so so in such bad shape after all. Uh, well, so first of all, uh, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the economy is an interesting thing. We discussed this a little bit. And the, the reality is the economy is usually a function of the previous decision. Well, and I say this purely from a political standpoint, which, um, pardon my French. Actually, I'm not sure this is French, but um, that's fucking stupid. Mm. Like, seriously, who, who actually considers – you know, politics as a, a a true measurement of happiness is 
they're, they're out of their fucking minds. But anyway, if you want to look at this purely from a political standpoint, um, and if, if anything, the economic activity today happened due to decisions and activity that happened, if you want to think about it politically, in the previous two pre, uh, presidential administrations. So you could really look at what's happening today as a product of you know, the Bush and maybe a bit more so the Obama administration. But people, people still look at today and like, woohoo, the stock market's up. You know, President Trump is my hero. I mean, they can't see past. You know, we, we mentioned they're like they're like a horse with blinders on. They're like, I can't see anything outside of this this narrow band of uh, field or this narrow field of vision. Right? right. They, they don't. They can't see anything outside of there. It. I mean, I have this opinion anyway. Pe- people have the the shortest memory of any creature. Right? They have humans have the shortest memory of any creature on Earth. And you hear people talk about, you know, certain things. We talk about like the dollar and the, the the failure of fiat currency. And people say, What do you mean the failure of fiat currency? I mean it's going it's it's gonna last forever. You know, the US dollar is the uh, the safest currency in the world, reserve currency in the world. We don't we don't even think that in the in the course of human history, the dollar, the US dollar in its current form is only about a hundred years old. Right? Yeah. I mean, a hundred years old. I mean, we're talking the planet. I mean, you know, we don't need to get into a, a science lesson here, but the planet's been here at least, you know, millions of years that we know about. Mm-hmm. And a hundred years, people can't think beyond that. We've had multiple versions of money over the course of history. Right. Right. I mean, it's it's all an evolution, and we're at the end of the we're at the tail end of this. U.S. dollar revolution. There's no way this is going to continue. But people have a narrow, you know, narrow field of vision. They can't. Yeah, see. no, absolutely. I, you know, and this has been apparent to me for a long time. You know, I, mm. I thought that, you know, uh, the dollar was going to crash a while ago, and you know, now it's just it's it, it's kind of strange. Like we've been in this kind of Frankenstein malaise, weird economy for a while, and. Um, you know what people have have always said is like you know compared to what you know uh, and that you know it's the best the, the dollar is the best thing going on right now uh, even though it's not great. Um, it's the least ugly girl at the dance, right? right. <laughs> but the I least mean, yeah, ugly it, it's girl just at the crazy dance. how long they can continue this. I mean, because it's obviously a debt based system, and Americans have no savings, um, and it's just you know so many. Uh, you know, markets in the U.S. are are just run on complete, uh, you know, fake credit. I mean, if you look at the medical system and the and the the education system, um, all these, you know, the the banking system, uh, Silicon Valley, you know, and it's just crazy because you know, for someone that looks at economics like rationally, it doesn't make any sense. You know, how do you make sense of all this? Well. So here's here's an interesting thought uh, thought exercise. Imagine today if we paid off every single dollar of debt on Earth, or euro, or yen, or uh, Swiss franc, or whatever. If we paid off every single penny of debt owed on Earth, we'd have no money left. Nothing. We couldn't even pay off all the debt we right. have with the money that we currently have in existence. The point is, all money right now is debt. It's a right. function of debt. We don't have any money itself is debt right now. Mm-hmm. Not, and people say, well, you know, money has value. Well, it has, an, it has no intrinsic value. But then again, you know, and I'm not a gold bug. I, I like gold. It's cool. It's pretty, whatever. But gold doesn't really have any intrinsic value, right? I think a one ounce, um, what's a gold called? Uh, Canadian maple leaf, for example. I take a one ounce Canadian maple leaf. I mean, what utility does that really have, right? Yeah. I mean, it can be used a little bit in circuit boards for electricity. It's got a little bit of utility there, um, but not not much else, right? So, I mean, what what is money other than what we what we trust and believe it to be is what it is. But at least gold was not a function of debt. But today, all paper currency, all fiat, is a function of debt. It is only created through debt, which is fascinating. But people yeah. forget that, right? Just like back to the political discussion, people, you know, people forget that 
you know, really, they can't think beyond a certain field of vision. And President Trump is my hero because the stock market's going up. Well, I mean, come on, he's been in office one year. It's like saying President Obama was um, the most peaceful president in U.S. history because he got a Nobel Peace Prize. Honestly, (laughs) how fucking stupid is that? I mean, he's the only president in U.S. history that was literally at war every single day of his presidency for two terms. But yeah, yeah sure, he's, he's the most peaceful guy ever because yeah. he got a Nobel Peace Prize. People don't think about stuff like that. Yeah. Well, you know what's crazy to me is that – so even in you know the Keynesian terms, okay, like all of these, these top economists are self-proclaimed you know, Keynesians. And uh, you know, according to them, when you have a, you know, a boom you know, when you, uh, in, in the economy, that's the time <clears throat> you need to be saving, not running huge deficits – and so that you can save some some powder for when the economy goes down. Uh, but now, you know, we've been in a bull market for what, you know, more than five years now. And we've been uh, in a bull market for nine years. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, you know, running sky high deficits. Now I just see this article. What is it? A one point five trillion dollar infrastructure um, bill in the States, you know, after they just proposed a tax cut. So it's like. You know what the hell? They're just just like throwing everything out the window. So I guess you know when when the bull market uh, does um, stop, I mean we're really fucked. You know it's funny you mentioned that 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 infrastructure bill in the new the new budget. I think it's it's kind of interesting. They've actually if if you really dig deep into that, they've actually redefined the definition of infrastructure. Mm. So you and I, or you know, anybody with a three digit IQ is going to think of infrastructure as what roads, bridges, railways, um, you know, upgrading airports, subway systems, maybe, um, you know, water treatment plants, power plants, stuff like that. Those are all infrastructure things to me, power lines, um, fiber optic cable, all infrastructure stuff. They've actually redefined the definition of infrastructure. So what they're claiming to be infrastructure now, they're funding money towards um, hiring police officers, for example. Mm. Tell me again how increasing the staff of the Chicago Police Department by 20% or whatever the number is, is an infrastructure. That's not infrastructure. Fixing the roads in Chicago is infrastructure. Right. You know, putting in fiber optic cable is infrastructure. Hiring 20 percent more police officers is not infrastructure. I, it, they've actually redefined the definition of infrastructure in this bill, which is wow. fascinating to me. Yeah. So it goes back to my view. A lot of people s- still put too much weight on on politics. I mean, I, it's funny whenever I come back to the States, I can't go to a coffee shop. Or, I mean, I can't even go with a friend, like a a local friend here, without having a long-term, long-standing conversation on politics. You can't go to a coffee shop without overhearing everybody around you talking about politics. When I'm in Europe, nobody talks about politics. Most people don't give a shit about politics. Um, But here, man, it's like like a national sport to talk about politics. And people put too much weight on it, like – it really matters. Like, oh my God, I can't believe we have President Trump as a president. He's a misogynistic pig. <laughs> well, so fucking what? Right. Whatever. He's yeah. a misogynist. Right. And? And what? How does yeah. that impact your day to day life? Well, he's an embarrassment to the country. And? So, does your cereal taste different in the morning because he's an embarrassment to the country? Right. Does it right. make any difference how, how your coffee tastes when you go on your coffee break at ten fifteen? Yeah. I mean, you watch your foot you watch the Super Bowl last weekend. Did somehow him being a misogynist pig affect whether I don't even know who played in the Super Bowl, but what, did did it affect who won your sports ball championship? No. No yeah. no difference whatsoever. Right. You had a glass of wine when you got home from work. Was it was it more bitter because, you know, he's a misogynist? No. Of course not. Well, you know, one of the things that I notice uh, always when I go back to the States is even in bars, I mean, well, everywhere (laughs) in, you know, they they just have these big screens with this stupid uh, news on or whatever. 
It's everywhere. It's a <laughs> bar. I mean, it's just like 10, 20 screen. I was at this bar in San Diego a couple weeks ago, and it's just like, you know, it's a, bar, it's a bar. You're supposed to be hanging out talking to people, and they just got huge screens, you know, at least 20 in a circle all the way around you, you know, and, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, like a restaurant or, or uh, you know, the hospital or the airport or the doctor's office or whatever, <clears throat> hotel lobby you got big screens pumping this propaganda and it really is like honestly i it's think a sport. That, what's that i'm telling you it's a, it's a freaking sport I, you're right Politics you're right is, you know and, is, and, is, a, is a new sport right yeah and i think or that, religion yeah and <laughs> and i think that i mean obviously there's a lot of people that watch you know fox and and get caught up in that side of it but what i'm seeing now is you know have you heard of this what they call like trump derangement syndrome uh where, you know, I honestly, like, it's funny, but I think that that is, like, that's serious. Like, there are people who watch way too much CNN. They watch CNN for hours and hours a day, and they really have, you know, it, it's it's like they've given this mental problem, you know, this hysteria to, you know, probably millions of people. I mean, they, they are, like, mind-controlled – they're they're just fucking like they're miserable and they're hate they're like full of hate and um it's all it's all from you know they they they're getting these uh, this Trump derangement system directly from the TV just pumped into their heads you know it's nuts and so, so I'll, I'll I'll tell you something so I about three months ago I I bought a TV this is actually the first TV I've owned in probably ten years and. I mean, the last, the last TV I owned was a tube TV. You know, it's like like two feet thick, right? I mean, it's a 27-inch screen TV, which now, like, you don't even want to – you don't even want a monitor on your desk that's 27 inches, right? That's even a small monitor now. This 27-inch TV was the last TV I owned that I threw away 10 years ago. I bought a new TV about three months ago. It was first time. And – Honestly, I feel like not having a TV for 10 years was probably the best thing I did for my brain because I avoided all this perpetual brainwashing. But the one thing I'm noticing now, now that I'm, I have a TV and I can watch TV again, the one thing I think that is amazing and fascinating is everything is streaming now. People don't watch I mean, people intentionally watch CNN or Fox or whatever, but, you know, they're doing that on purpose. But you don't have the the passive brainwashing that you had 10 or 15 years ago. Nowadays, you're intentionally um, – you're buying the Netflix subscription or you're buying the, the, the Amazon Prime subscription or the Hulu or maybe you have your show on Showtime. So you buy the monthly Showtime because everybody has smart TVs now, right? So you at least you at least can selectively you know filter out what you're you're watching. So actually I believe it to be a good thing. I actually find it to be a very very positive thing. It's less brainwashing. People because I don't know 10 years ago you turn on the TV, I mean, okay, maybe you had what was the thing called where you could pause and fast forward on TV? DVR, yeah. Well, yeah, DVR. This is, this is like this. Seriously, this is how long it's been since I've had a TV. I don't yeah. even remember what this shit's called. Um, but yeah, DVR or TiVo was the other one, right? Yeah. So you did have that where you could pause and fast forward. But I remember like ten or fifteen years ago having cable TV, and we like if I was going to watch a show that was like an hour long, I remember I'd pause it at the beginning, and then I wouldn't start watching the show for like twenty minutes. So I so then I could fast forward through all the commercials. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, this is brilliant. This is the most amazing, fascinating thing ever. I can avoid all the commercialism, and I don't have to watch the news, and I can skip the, the news blips and the commercials. But nowadays, I mean, I, if you watch TV, what do you do? You go on Netflix, dun, 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 you, you find the thing you want, you watch it, and you can selectively filter out. And I think that's good for people's brains because they're not – passively getting brainwashed on bullshit which may be why i I feel like there's a little bit of an awakening now Mm -hmm. completely a positive benefit i mean we talked about this a little bit yeah Um, i am i am as apolitical as as a person comes i mean i i'm very much 
fundamentally, I'm an anarchist. I just don't believe in a role for government. <clears throat> and I believe technology, okay, you could say 50 years ago or 100 years ago, maybe there was a role for government. But I think a lot of technology is starting to fill that role that basically eliminates the need <coughs> eliminates the need for government. So fundamentally, um, I'm an anarchist, and I think this awakening is, of people, people are starting to realize they're being brainwashed. They're starting to realize they're being manipulated, which is why, again, I'm as apolitical as anybody you can imagine, but I do believe President Trump is the best president ever in U.S. history. If for no other reason he beat all the standing Republican lifelong career politicians, which was phenomenal. I mean, who in their right mind would have thought when you saw the list of all the Republican nominees, you would think, you know, I'm going to pick the guy who owns Miss America, right? You would never guess Donald Trump. I mean, he's a goofball. Well, he basically but, had to he basically had to blow up the Republican Party to run. I think that's what's funny. A lot of Democrats are getting mad about it, but it's like he's not really a Republican. I mean, he had to, like I said, he had to blow up the entire party that they had. Nobody, none of the, nobody in the Republican Party wanted him to run. He just bulldozed his way in there. So it was pretty incredible. He did, but the Republicans nominated him, right? Which means the people that that, that the the registered Republicans that vote in the primaries, they all said, listen, the dozen of you career politicians, we're sick of your bullshit. We're sick of your cronyism, blah, blah, blah. We're sick of all your bullshit. We're going to elect the outsider. And then he blew up, he blew up mainstream media. I mean, he won the fucking election on Twitter. I don't care what anybody says, how stupid and ridiculous his tweets are. It's marketing. People like people lose their shit about his Twitter posts or his tweets, but they don't understand he's a marketing genius. He has a marketing genius that manages all of his social media campaigns. Yeah. He is a brilliant marketer. He won the election on Twitter. I don't care what you say about it. Right. He blew up mainstream media. I mean, one of my favorite scenes ever, and I'm sure you saw it, and I absolutely loved it, is there was a press conference and the CNN guy kept trying to Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And he, he just pointed at him and he goes, I'm sorry, we don't talk to fake news. And he went to the next one. Right. Like it was it was beautiful. Yeah. And then he and he beat he beat the Clintons, right, who've been in power since um some type of political power for what, thirty years? Between, you know various I mean, you know, Bill was the president, she was secretary, uh secretary of state. I mean he beat the Clintons. So to me, not whether he does anything good or not, it's it's irrelevant. To me, it's – how did you say? He he, he Something red pill. What that was he, your – he, he has red pilled more people than Ron Paul. You know, Ron Paul basically used his platform you – know, or the, the presidential platform. He knew he wasn't going to win to say all these things, and it did. You know, that was the big thing. A lot of people – uh, going to you know libertarianism and stuff like that in 2008, especially young people, it was a Ron Paul revolution. And basically, you know, I think Donald Trump re uh, red pilled more people than Ron Paul just on the media and on all kinds of stuff with his Twitter, you know, with being politically incorrect, you know, all this type of stuff. So, right, yeah. So he he red pilled a ton, millions and millions and millions of people, um, and, and basically the American people. <laughs> but what we were talking about that comedian, but basically the American people said, hmm, okay, I can vote for Hillary Clinton, who is a complete scumbag, or I can vote for this clown over here who we don't know what the fuck he's going to do. Yeah. Scumbag, clown. Scumbag, clown. Well, fuck it. Let's take the clown, yeah. right? Because, <laughs> I mean, it, it's worth the risk. And so the American people said, I, I, we're gonna we're gonna roll the dice on this guy because we're so fed up with the Republicans. We're fed up with the Democrats. We're fed up with getting brainwashed by mainstream media. We're fed up with the political system as it is. But we're gonna we're just gonna take a flyer on this guy and see what the hell happens, right? So this is my opinion. This is why I believe Trump is the greatest president in U.S. history because 
he may be one of the things that has finally gotten the American people to wake up. Mm. Well, uh, you know, I, I think that regardless, uh, uh, you know, of what you think, you got to, I mean, if you're wise, then you would take a look at this monumental event that happened and try to learn something from it. Uh, even if you're completely horrified that Trump was elected, you can't take it as a learning. How did that happen? Uh, how did he do that? How did he pull it off? Because it was an amazing uh, thing that he pulled off. You know, oh, and, he ran it like a business. Yeah. Surprise! <laughs> he won it like a business, right? I mean, you know, people say, "Oh, he got murdered in California, New York." Like he didn't get any votes. Yeah. Because he spent zero, zero campaign dollars in California and New York because the initial polls showed he had zero chance of winning. Well, if you're a business person and all the an analysis says, if I build a factory in whatever, Ohio, and I'm going to lose money on everything I produce in Ohio – what kind of dumbass business person says, well, let me invest all my money in Ohio? Right. Right? That's stupid. So he says, well, I'm not going to – I have no chance of winning. And in the electoral college system, even if I win 49.9%, I don't get the electoral votes anyway. So why throw all my money at the two most expensive states to campaign in? Let me spend all my money everywhere else where I have a chance. So right. he ran it like a business, right? Um, people just can't. They just can't wrap their head around it. Oh, he lost the popular vote. Of course he did. I mean, because California and New York are the two most populous states. Yeah. If he would have spent five times the amount of money, you know, like like uh, Hillary did, he would have gotten a lot more votes. Maybe he would have won the popular vote. Yeah. I don't know. Well, who cares? He That's probably, not the game they're playing. That doesn't exactly. make any sense. That's <laughs> he played the game like a business person, yeah. right? I mean, even if he spent five times the money, he probably still wouldn't have won New York and California. He he might have won the electoral vote. Um, I mean, uh, sorry, the popular vote. But I mean, who knows? But he wasn't stupid. Why why spend all that money? Right. So uh, as we're talking about this, you know, there's this big thing um, about you know the memo memo and the FISA uh, surveillance and stuff like that. <laughs> and well, the funniest thing is that in the middle of that. You know, where he has uh, Obama, uh, you know, uh, and, and well, people from Obama's administration, uh, you know, giving false information to on these rubber stamp FISA courts to, um, uh, you know, spy on some people in his administration. And then at the same time, they're like passing bills that would allow more of this type of surveillance and stuff like that. I think I saw an, yeah, an article about that, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, ba basically, he extended he extended FISA, right? He yeah. extended it so and and made it a little bit worse, right? Because, I mean, he he's I mean he's president, right? So he he wants he wants that control. I mean, he's becoming a politician. Mm. He wasn't one before, but he's becoming one. Now he has done some good things. Not to get off topic on FISA, but one thing I do love that he did since he's taken office. Um, they basically laid off almost half the uh, IRS staff, which is, I mean, huge, huge win. Yeah, really. So it, they don't have the manpower to go after all the all the people um, on um, audits and stuff like they used to. I mean, he's he's killed a lot of a lot of stuff like that, right? Just because, I mean, he's a business person and. He recognizes. I mean, if you look at his tax plan, it's not great for everybody, but it's great for more. It's great for probably eighty percent of the people. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, overall, it's it's a it's a net positive. Of course, you and I would like to see a zero tax, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's probably not going to happen. Ron Paul. I mean, even if we elected Ron Paul, he wouldn't he wouldn't dismantle the treasure or the the IRS. He he could try. He could make it as a campaign promise, and he could say all he wanted, but it ain't going to happen. Right. Um, so at least doing something that's a net positive. But FISA is just – it's just more and more overreaching powers. I mean it was something that has – it has to be renewed or like uh, it's every five years, I believe. I forget now. Four years or five years. I think five years. And he just renewed it and made it a little bit worse.
right? Yeah. So now, now we can wiretap American citizens. Yay! <laughs> you know, right? Yeah, Whatever. It's, it's, I mean, it's not like we weren't doing it anyway. Like, what difference is the law? If 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 the NSA or the FBI wants to wiretap you or me, I don't think a law is going to stop them. Or it it just gives them. If they want to take us to court for it, it allows them to use it as a as evidence against us. Whereas if 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 it wasn't legal, they couldn't use it as evidence against us in court. But they would find some other way. Right. Yeah. No. And it's it's crazy how quickly um, we have just accepted this that you know we have no privacy and anybody can spy on you at any time and anybody can look at any of your correspondence and we all know that it's it's all public anyways and. You know, what has it been, like 10 years? And then that quick, boom, everybody's just accepted uh, no privacy whatsoever. And who knows what in another 10 or 20 years what people will accept. Oh, no. Yeah, I mean, now now you're – now now ha- people have these um, these Google Home devices and these Amazon Alexa devices. I, I, I'm not a tinfoil hat guy. Like, I, I'm not so paranoid that I think the NSA is spying on us through our, our Alexa device. But technically, they could. Like, it is technically a possibility that all of a sudden James becomes a person of interest and he happens to have an Alexa at home. Well, uh, it wouldn't, it's not so much of a stretch for, you know, the NSA to, to go to Amazon and say, hey, we need to have access to this account and listen in on this guy's home activities. It's not a stretch. And, right. and technically, it's very possible. You put the damn device in your house anyway. It's like you're saying, you know what? I don't really need privacy anyway. I mean, what's the meme I saw? I saw a pretty funny meme lately. Somebody at, like it was somebody asked the girl, um, "Do you have a security system for your house?" <clears throat> and she said, "No, no. I just say some terroristy shit to my Alexa, and then the NSA watches my house for me." Right. You know, it's kind of funny, right? Yeah. In a sense, but I mean, really. You know, there, all that data probably does route through some NSA server somewhere, and has some algorithms that pick up on certain certain patterns and keywords and topics. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the you know the idea is is that uh, we all know you know big data, right? Big data has been the, the the buzzword for a lot of these tech companies for a while, and um, with whether it's Alexa or Siri or whatever, uh, all of your you know, online uh, communications and everything you do on there as far as Web 2.0. Uh, it's all been built around collecting everything um, about you. And they have just like huge files. You would be absolutely amazed at how much information they have on you. They can figure out, you know, what everything that you like, you know, what type of, uh, you know, where, where your politics are, where you like to, you know, what, what are your hobbies, uh, how much money you have, where you spend mo- most of your time, what type of sex you like, whatever. You know what I mean? The, the, and uh, I know, uh, just reading this article the other day, they said that somebody had sued the government, or no, I'm sorry, they sued the um, Match.com uh, for their files on their, t- on like their Tinder. And just with somebody's Tinder profile, they had 600 pages of information on you know <laughs> what, what they're likely to swipe on how long they're likely to have a conversation and all this type of stuff like straight out of black mirror you know i don't know if you've seen this series the latest black oh mirror. god yeah i love <laughs> yeah, black mirror great. but um you know so the idea is like with all these the internet of things and you know that we're gonna have 5g everywhere and all this fast internet and all these smart devices and it all can listen to us and puts a profile together and you know basically have us living in these like smart cities i mean i do think that's that's what they want to do i mean that you know easily control people uh especially with um when you know you if you want to implement something like they're doing in china where you have uh you know the serial credit score where you know if you like the wrong thing or you happen to walk in a place that's not you know popular you have a friend who might have said something politically incorrect at some point in his life uh, again, like the Black Mirror <laughs> uh, episode, and um, because of that, oh, you know, you can't get a job, and you can't, you know, open a bank account or whatever. And so there are all kinds of things, and I think that this is, 
Yeah, this is happening, and and it's happening like quickly. You know what I mean? So maybe that is maybe I am in the uh, the tinfoil hat uh, crowd, but that's I mean it seems pretty obvious it's happening to me. It's crazy, but I don't know. It's, it's happening. It's not that they want it; it's that we want it. Yeah. I mean, we're the one we're the ones putting our information on Facebook and on Twitter, right. and um, you know we're the ones doing all of our using technology that yep. we know is trackable. We're the ones using this stuff because it's a convenience for us. Yeah. We like the convenience. There's a downside to the convenience. And another thing um, I would say is a lot of people don't realize, I mean, the government was instrumental in building a lot of these tech companies. A lot of the technology that we use uh, in the, the smart devices and all this type of stuff was developed by the defense department. And uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of the, you know, these companies, even from the very beginning, they had offices with, uh, you know, government agents in there. So it's, they, you know, I, I feel like <clears throat> they've kind of used uh, the, they, they, they've they packaged the uh, authoritarian system kind of in a liberal, uh, like a classical liberal, um, you know, free market sense. Like, oh, but these are companies. Mm-hmm. So it's okay, but it's actually you know under that guise it's because everybody you know more or less accepts uh, free market economics uh, you know, nowadays more than in the past, and uh, so they just use that as far as like, oh yeah these these are these are private companies so it's okay they can do all this stuff and there's nothing you can say about it but it's been you know the same people behind it, but uh, well I I posted something on Facebook a couple of weeks ago I went shoe shopping, and I was just. Had my phone in my pocket, went shoe shopping, walking around the shoe store, bought a couple of pairs of shoes, went home. The next day, I started seeing um, Facebook ads for shoe stores near me. Like, I mean, and, and if you look at your terms of service on your Facebook app on your phone, it actually says on there, Facebook has the ability to listen to you, even if your mic is turned off and even if you're not logged into your app. Facebook mm-hmm. listens to your conversations. It says it in the terms of service. They're they're clear about it. They tell you up front. But we still use that stuff. And right. we, we it, it is a convenience. There are things you can do to protect your privacy with some of this stuff. Nothing's foolproof, but there are some things you can do. Um, the, the, the issue is it's a little bit of an inconvenience, and it will cost you a little bit of money to do it. And so people are like, eh you know what, it's not worth it, right? Right. Like using a VPN, for example. You can use a VPN on your computer and on your smartphone so that you, and you can set them up, I mean, depending on the VPN, but you can set them up where you don't, it doesn't allow any cookies on your devices. So the websites themselves are not learning any data about you because it, it blocks all cookies, right? You can set your VPN to, log you in from a certain IP address. You can choose, do I want to log in from Malaysia, Sweden, Mexico, Chile? You can choose where you log in from on your IP address to protect your, you know, some of your data there. You can use, you know, encrypted emails. Like you can just have PG, PGP in your emails. But that's, I mean, all that stuff is kind of, you know, it, it creates some inconveniences, right? So if I want to send you an encrypted email... You need to download the, uh, the the software that allows you to communicate with me. I have to send you my pri- send you my email key, my private key, so you can save me in your email system. I mean, it's it's not like just hey James, quick email, right? Right. It's I have to send you this. You have to download the program. You have to upload the the file, and then we and then we can communicate in an encrypted format. And that those additional roadblocks. People are like, eh, eh, fuck it. I'll yeah. give up my privacy, right? Yeah. It's easier just to give up my privacy. So your point, what you were saying is that's what they want. It's mm-hmm. not necessarily what they want. It's what we want, you know, as, as, as humans. Yeah. We, want the, we want the convenience and we want the simplicity of it. And we're willing, we're completely willing. I don't mean me or you. I use a lot of these privacy things. I do a ton of this stuff. I mean, like... For example, you would never find my home address in public record anywhere, ever. It doesn't exist. Um, because I've been, I've been intentional and conscientious about 
the data I provide to da data aggregators, you know, these databases that aggregate your data. You'll never find my home address there. Um, stuff like that. You'll, <clears throat> you, you couldn't even, you, you would net, if, even if you pull my credit report, you couldn't guess which state I live in. Even if you could pick a state that I lived in, right? Um, you could probably guess on my Facebook where I live, but it doesn't say it. You, if you read enough, you could probably guess it, or if you had the right data tools. But you could you couldn't guess exactly my address. There's no way. Right. Um. But you know, I I have a I, I have a, let's say a junior tinfoil hat. Right. <laughs> so I'm 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 a. Uh, I, I am conscientious about this stuff, and I, I do intentionally try to protect my privacy. But it, I mean, nothing's foolproof. But it, it's you know, it's it's something. It's better than nothing. But most people aren't willing to do that. Most people are just most. I mean, the vast majority of people are like, eh, fuck it. I don't have anything to hide. Who cares? I'll just I'll put it all out there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I, I do want to talk about. Living internationally, I've been seeing a lot more people um, in the states. But all, well, let me just say real quick: there have been a ton of people from guess which, guess which state, California, that have been contacting California, me like crazy, yeah. getting out of there. I mean, it's like I've, I, it's definitely more than half the people um, that you know are interested in my relocation package that I do in San Miguel de Allende. And just that I, I talked on the internet or so there from California. I think I read an article the other day. It was specifically about San Francisco. But I think people are, you know, rushing out of California like crazy. Um, but, you know, I've seen a, a lot of people asking, you know, just in general, you know, it doesn't seem like there's too many places to go. Like, you know, people are like, where can I go that's not fucked up? You know what I mean? So you seem to really like um, – Latvia, right? A lot. Uh, you've been all over the, the the world and stuff like that. So, so what is it about over there that you've liked so much? And uh, what are some other kind of recommendations for people that are looking around and trying to, you know, look for a good place to go? Okay, <clears throat> I'll get to that in just a second. I want to hit on your point you mentioned, though. Um, I am. I'm also seeing a big trend of people trying to escape. But I think a lot of that is a function of technology now. Mm -hmm. And also, it's a changing in the job marketplace. Yeah. <clears throat> 10, 20 years ago, people really wanted you sitting at a desk, punching a clock at 8 o'clock, checking out at 6 o'clock or whatever, yeah. right? Nowadays, there's a big trend. Even if you work for a company, there's a big trend for remote work. You know, you, you can work from home. You log in. You, you have a phone system that rings, you know, puts you in the phone tree. I mean, even like JetBlue. I don't know if you know JetBlue, the, the airline. Yeah. Um, somebody told me one time that JetBlue, like the reps that, that book plane tickets and stuff, they all work from home. And I thought, no way. So I called. And normally I book on my plane tickets online. But one time I called and I talked to the lady on the phone because I was curious. And I said, hey, um, just out of curiosity, do you work from home or do you work in a call center? And she goes, no, nah, I work from home. I'm sitting at my house here in, uh, somewhere in Utah. Yeah. And we got to talking to the lady on the phone. And she said, basically, she went to a training at wherever, I guess, wherever JetBlue's headquarters are. I don't know. She went to training to learn her job, and they they sent her a package with a computer, a phone system, a headset, all the desk hardware she would need to do her job, and they pay for her internet connection. And the technology allows her, sitting at her desk, to be in the phone tree. You know when you call JetBlue, please, please wait one minute for your – uh, next available agent. What yep. puts her in the phone tree to receive the call anywhere in the world, right? And so there's a big trend because technology allows this. Companies are like, why are we paying for all this huge office space when we can have our workers you know, work from home? And they're more productive and happier anyway. And even more so, there's the big trend towards um, – Outsourcing. I've got a friend of mine who's an industrial engineer, and he went to his boss a few years ago and said, "Hey, how about you fire me and I <coughs> hire me as a contractor yeah. to do the work, and I'll work from home." And now he he spends his winters in Montana skiing, and he spends his summers in Greece. You know, but he does his he does his job. Yeah. 
he actually ended up building a business out of it, outsources all of his engineering projects to guys in India, and he brought on he took on three or four new clients. So he makes a lot more money now and works less. Mm-hmm. But there's a big trend towards outsourcing and solopreneurship where you may have had a job at one point, but your company said, why don't we hire you as a contractor and you work from home? And you're effectively a solopreneur with one, maybe two clients. And, and so it's a big trend. And so now people are going, hmm, well, you know, I did work at this office here in Anaheim, California, but now I can work from home and – You know, the traffic sucks here. Taxes are ridiculous. You know, I mean, the only good thing really about California, at least Southern California, is the weather anyway, right? But there's plenty of places with good weather. Yeah. Um, So now the trend is people are freed up and they're starting to think, hmm, maybe I could, maybe I'd have a better quality of life if I didn't have to pay $14 for a beer and pay 65% in tax, right? So they're like, Let's get the hell out and move somewhere else. But, <clears throat> and I'm not anti, you know, completely anti America per se. I, I wouldn't want to live in California just because, uh, I mean, for, for me, it wouldn't make much of a difference. I'd work from home, traffic wouldn't bother me. But I don't know. I don't, I don't like the mindset. The taxes are insane. It, the cost of living is ridiculous. Like, yeah. it's crazy. I, I get, you know, I'm in North Carolina right now, and I, you know, my home is in Latvia. Even North Carolina, which is one of the cheapest places in the U.S. to live, I come here from Latvia, and I'll go grocery shopping, and I'm like, "Holy shit, groceries are expensive here!" You know, I I pay in Latvia like for really good, high quality, fresh food at the supermarket. I'm paying half what I do. In North Carolina. Like I said, imagine what it would be if, comparatively if I was in like California. Right? Yeah. So I mean, there's so many things. Um, you know, if if you put it all together, it's ridiculous how much. So say that you're you're in that position where you're like we'll use our our uh, previous example, somebody who is an employee in you know California, <clears throat> and they say, okay, I want to do this. I want my boss to fire me, and uh, I'm going to become a contractor. And then say they move to uh, Latvia, since we said, okay. So not only is their food costs cut in half, what would you say their rent's cut in half? Um, they can use the foreign income tax exclusion. Uh, they, uh, you know, their medical costs are cut. I mean, how, how from in that example, how much, like the cost of living or, qual- I, you know, compared to how much would you adjust Put it this that? way. If your gross salary was – if you work in California, your gross pre-tax salary is $100,000 a year, you could have the same same quality of life living in Latvia or most anywhere in Eastern Europe for twenty twenty five thousand. 25000 Right. Now, but that's factoring everything in because – so first of all, if you're in California, right off the top, you're paying $50,000 in taxes, mm. Right. I mean, you're going to net. You're going to net, even with deductions. Okay, maybe you would net sixty thousand, right? But you've got you you got your state and federal taxes. Then you have cost of living, right? You can go to like numbio dot com um, right. and compare cost of living between like San Diego, California, and Riga, Latvia. It's mind blowing. Like, oh yeah. And, and by the way, Riga is not the cheapest city to live. Um, it's. And I've seen it go up since I've I've lived there for several years. I've seen it go up in price, but still, like when I go grocery shopping in Latvia, I walk out and I'm like, "That's a lot of food for you know four bags of groceries." When I go to the grocery store in North Carolina, it's like, "Fucking shit, that's expensive!" Like yeah. it's so much <laughs> more expensive. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, you know. Um, but you got to figure number one. Um. You're going to get the foreign earned income exclusion. So you, you can essentially not pay any tax. I mean, I'm simplifying because there's some there's a lot of details involved with that. But you can effectively eliminate your, your income tax rate <coughs> if you're living kind of as a tourist in different countries, um, you know, and working remotely, that kind of thing. Um, number two, health care costs. Right off the bat, if you – I mean, I'm 43. If I lived in California right now and had 
had even like a, a minimal kind of health insurance policy, I bet I'd be paying six, seven hundred bucks a month for an insurance policy. Mm-hmm. So it's what eight thousand dollars, seven, eight thousand dollars a year, plus whatever I'd pay for a couple of copays and office visits and any any deductible per year. So I'm eight to ten thousand dollars a year right off the top is what I'm spending in healthcare costs, assuming nothing crazy happens. Just with help the yeah. health insurance cost itself plus plus my uh, uh, any little stuff I might do for checkups and stuff. Right. So I'm let's say eight grand a year. So that's what uh, six hundred, almost seven hundred bucks a month, right there. I mean that's you know not insignificant money, right? Um. So if I were going to move to Latvia from California, first of all, I wouldn't have health insurance other than the bare minimum requirement you need to establish residency there. Because, like, I, I have the bare minimum, which just covers me for anything catastrophic over fifteen thousand euros. Um, but I don't, I don't. I mean, when I when I go to a doctor, I pay cash. If I go get my yeah. teeth cleaned, I pay. I just pay cash. Yeah, if I go, too. you know, to get a blood test or whatever, I just pay cash. All right, I'll give you an example. I had um, an ear infection a few weeks ago, and I just went to the doctor to get it checked out, make sure nothing was wrong. And went to the doctor. She's like, yeah, no problem. Here's some cream, some prescription cream. Just put in it for a couple of days. You'll be good. So my doctor visit and the prescription cream that she gave me was 20, 35 euros. Mm. So what's that, like $42 or something like that? That was the cash price, by the way. Yeah. This is not my copay. This is not my deductible. My cash price was about $42 for a doctor's visit, which I got the appointment, by the way, same day. Right. None of the socialized medicine bullshit where I got to get a doctor's appointment six weeks in advance. <laughs> right. This is a private, this is a private doctor, not, not state, not, a, not like state care. This is a, you know, private, private doctor. Yeah. That's actually a little more expensive than here. <clears throat> yeah. So. If I go get my teeth clean, it's like 15 or 20 euros, depending on which dentist I go to. So it's, what, 20 to 25 bucks, basically. Right. Um, you know, so cost of living is, is good. Quality of life is very good. Um, you know, I mean, they, they have cold winters, so you, you got to think about, like, weather-wise. But people ask me, like, what should I, you know, I, I, want, I really want to move abroad and, and try something new and live somewhere else. Where should I move? I tell people you really need to make – it's really such a personal decision. There's so many factors you got to consider. One is weather. Um, some people hate hot weather. Some people hate cold weather. You know, Some people love cold weather. You know, They love snow. <coughs> um, you got to consider language um, and or your ability to learn a new language. Right. I mean, like in Latvia, everyone speaks English. You wouldn't have a problem there in English. But it would benefit you quite a bit to learn Latvian and or Russian. Is it a requirement? Nah, you could you could live there for years and never, never learn a, either language and be perfectly fine. But Medellin, Colombia? Forget it. You're, you're going to hate it in Medellin if you don't learn Spanish because mm-hmm. nobody speaks English there. I mean, these are just factors you got to consider. Portugal, you move to Lisbon. Great city. I love Portugal. I love Lisbon. The coastal area is amazing. I've noticed a lot of people interested in in going there to Portugal, by the way. It's fantastic. Yeah. But Portuguese people, by and large, don't speak English. Right. So you you don't have a lot of – I mean, if you're in an expat area or something, of course, you're going to have a lot of English speakers. But if you're going to, like, you know, ingratiate yourself with the local community, you're probably going to at least learn some basic Portuguese. Right. So, I mean, language is an issue. Um, if you're just not willing to learn a foreign language, you know, places like Medellin, it's not going to be the thing for you. It's, right. it's just not going to work for you. You're going to hate it there because the only people you're going to talk to are other expats. You'll never, you'll never, like, have any local friends. It, it just, it's, it'll be tedious. Yeah. Um, same in Portugal. So that's, that's another thing. Culture is another thing to consider. You know, um, I've, I've been to a lot of different countries around the world and cultures are different for me. I prefer European culture. Mm. Um, I just, 
I just prefer it. I really like Eastern European culture. Some people are going to find that very difficult because a lot of times the initial impression of, of Eastern European people in general is they're very cold and standoffish. Mm. Um, and that you – know, I could definitely see – how people get that initial impression, but um, I like the directness, and I, I find a lot of times um, a lot of Eastern European people are very, very friendly once you get to know them. It's not so hard to make friends, but your initial impression is, you know, like Latin Latin culture. My God, everybody's friendly, right? Yeah. People walk down the street saying hello to you, like just randomly passing on the street. Mm. All right, it's probably like that in Mexico, right? Yeah. Um, I know it is in Colombia. Like you just walk down the street and people are just saying hello to you on the street. If you do that in Latvia, people think you have a mental disorder. <laughs> is right? is uh, I'm just curious. Is Latvia or most people there? Is that like a Orthodox Christian? Is that the religion there? Or? Well, historically, I mean, it's a very pagan. Oh, it's right? a very pagan country. I mean, hmm. um. I mean, I guess you the, there's it's not a very religious country in general. Okay. Um, I'd say you know a lot of a lot of atheists, a lot of pagans, um, a lot of pagans. I mean, the, really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've I've been to a couple of pagan weddings. They're wow. they're the best. They are absolutely the best weddings to go to. They're cool. <laughs> okay. Um. The. I mean, there are churches there, you know, like there's Orthodox, Russian Orthodox churches there, yeah. there's Catholic churches, but there's not a culture where people like go to church every Sunday morning and, and, you know, go to church service and it's not very religious at all. Mm. I mean, I don't really know anybody that, can, I mean, maybe it's just my sphere, but like I, I've, most of the time the big churches are, are more used for like concerts. Right. They're very. Oh, is it like the new age, the new like modern churches with the smoke and rock concerts? No, 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 no. I mean, like, um, like an organ concert or like, um, you know, oh, like some type of classical music concerts. Oh, that's nice. That type of stuff. You know, yeah, or organ or piano and stuff like that. Yeah, that's great. Um, one of the big things I forgot about, you know, I. I was uh, out of the states for ten years, and I went to Texas for the first time in ten, you know, uh, ten years for six months last year. And um, one of the things that I forgot was, you know, th there were churches everywhere. How many churches there are, and um, like uh, very like the Protestant, but very religious, like evangelical. Uh, type of people. I I had not, you know, I just forgot all about that. And um, I don't know, it was just kind of caught me by surprise, you know, because like uh, I did a little bit of Uber driving. And uh, so I'd be driving somebody around and talking to them. And then like after 20 minutes, you know, this happened to me like at least five times. And so I'd be like, by the way, you know, I have to tell this to everybody. Um, have you accepted uh, your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Right, and would just start like with all this. I want you to come to church with me, and like really like evangelical type stuff. It's like what? It just caught me off guard, <laughs> like you know. And um, then I have to think: <laughs> Did I say anything in the last twenty minutes? Like that was like I don't know. My but, God, I, why can't people ask me these questions? Why? <laughs> oh, why can't I get people to do this to me? Like I, I've, I've, I'm like dying for a Jehovah's Witness to come to my door one day, like. It just ne – I never get so lucky that this happens to me. Yeah. I would just – I would totally put porn on the TV loudly yeah. and invite the Jehovah's Witness in. Come on in. Well, they when's have – they actually here – even here in Mexico, <laughs> they have uh, American Jehovah's Witnesses that go door to door, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, let's – I do want to – before we wrap up, I, I do want to talk about the uh, – you have a uh, offshore banking report. You have all different types of reports and stuff like that, but – I did want to talk a little bit about this, and I'm going to put a link to it. Um, it's basically, uh, you know, it's only twenty dollars, but you go through all the different, you know, if somebody does want to start thinking internationally, uh, putting some money, um, you know, overseas in different jurisdictions. Uh, you've gone through. I mean, it's not a full, comprehensive, you know, everything about every, but it gives you some options, right? So maybe, you know, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we. 
we wrote this report last year. Um, it's just a bunch of banks that bunch of banks and financial service providers that we recommend <coughs> out to out to our clients that we that we have some experience with. Um, yeah, it, I mean, we don't go into the financial details of each bank and their financial status and all that stuff. I mean, like you said, it's a twenty dollar report. I'm not I'm not writing up a financial analysis of twenty banks for twenty bucks, right? It's not not going to happen, but. We go into the pros and cons of each bank and, and um, which banks we recommend for what, how to open the accounts, if you need to appear in person or if you can do it online or if you need an introducer and stuff like that. And we have, we have some other options. We have a couple of banks in there you can open actually right online. You can have the account open in 15, 20 minutes. we got a couple of um, uh, investment options like online, like peer-to-peer lending platforms that we recommend that are also pretty good in there that, that have really good returns, non U S stuff. So, I mean, if, if you're really considering this internationalization strategy for yourself, you know, or your business or your wealth, whatever, if you're considering this, I mean, the step one really is to open a bank account outside of the country where you live, whether you're American or Canadian, Mexican, German, you know, wherever you, you you need to be diversified with some of your finances outside of your home country. Period. I mean, it's yeah, it, it's it's pretty pretty straightforward there. Um, and even if you don't, even if you're not like looking to become an expat, it's it's still a really really good idea to diversify. Honestly, I can't tell you once you start, it, especially for Americans, once you start banking outside of the u.s you start to realize how terrible u.s banks are like like i had one of the banks i work with um i could literally on my phone in a in on my phone in three clicks send a payment an instant payment transfer on on my phone with three clicks and be done with it it'd take me less than a minute to do it. If I try to use like a Bank of America or a Wells Fargo banking app to send an international bank transfer from my phone, first of all, I'd probably never figure out how to do it. <clears throat> Second, it'd probably take you 30 clicks to get to the point where you actually send the money. And that's assuming it's even possible. Like once you start, like you're using your Bank of America, for example, banking app, you're like, but the only thing you can do with your Bank of America banking app online is pay your Bank of America credit card. <laughs> that's about the only thing like that's easy to do. Um, but you, but once you, once you start banking outside of the U.S., you start to realize like, my God, this is so user friendly, so easy. I can hold thirty or forty different currencies in my bank account. You know. I can have I can have a debit card in euros, dollars, uh, Swiss francs, yen, and pesos all at the same time. You know, <laughs> you go to your Bank of America and you say, "Hey, I want to hold thirty different currencies in my account." They look at you like, "What? What are you talking about? We only do dollars. You can't hold you can't hold another currency." So, I mean, if for no other reason for diversification, some of your cash and some of your investments, having a having a bank account's a really, really good idea. Yeah, absolutely. And I also wanted to touch on real quick, before we were talking about cryptocurrency, there's a lot of people with some, you know, holdings in cryptocurrency now, and maybe they're not sure um, about, you know, what to do with that. Uh, I know that there's some restrictions, like you talked about, I think it was Wells Fargo that said if you had something to to do with cryptocurrency at all, they couldn't uh, open your bank account. So, what are some of the options? What what uh, might people want to think about if they have some uh, some gains in cryptocurrency that they're looking to uh, to get into the bank? Yeah, obviously, crypto is a, a hot topic right now. A lot of people are sitting on some pretty big gains. <laughs> of course, it depends on when you got in. If you bought all your Bitcoin in December of, of of this past year, you're probably not looking at some big gains. But if you've been in crypto for more than a year. Pretty, your portfolio's up. I mean, it may be down in the past month, but overall, it's it's up quite a lot. Um, 
And, you know, I get a lot of people say, you know, I'd, I'd like to take some chips off the table and maybe move some money into real estate or fiat currency or something like that. But it's becoming a hot topic and a lot of banks don't want to touch crypto now. So you, you put your money in your, in your wallet, your crypto wallet, your Bitcoin or your Ethereum or Litecoin or whatever you got. And you want to convert that into fiat so you can go buy some property or something. Um, the problem is a lot of times the banks don't want anything to do with crypto. So let's say you have a, a, a crypto, a centralized crypto exchange, something like um, Coinbase or something like that. And you say, OK, I'm going to convert all of my Bitcoin and or not. Let's say you want to convert fifty thousand dollars of your Bitcoin into dollars. And you say, that's great. Coinbase will do it. No problem. And then you want to wire that money out of Coinbase to your personal bank account. And Wells Fargo is a good example. So if you wire that money into Wells Fargo from Coinbase, there is a very, very high likelihood that, that Wells Fargo will shut your bank down. They'll close your account because um, Wells Fargo doesn't want anything to do with crypto. So if, if your money is anywhere linked to crypto, crypto trading, money exchange, um, any gains in crypto, they just say, nope, you know, we don't want anything to do with it. So you got to be careful with, with where you're banking. And there's a lot of U.S. banks right now that are very, very unfriendly to crypto because right now the regulation in the U.S. is very, very gray. Like no, Nobody really knows what to do with crypto right now. Even the IRS issued some rulings on taxation of crypto, and they're idiotic. I mean, they're, they're, they're stupid rulings that don't even make any sense. To, you know, like, for example, they issued a ruling that – in any in any hard fork where you receive um, a payout, like last summer, for example, Bitcoin Cash. If you own one Bitcoin, you got one Bitcoin Cash last summer, last August. The IRS issued a ruling saying that that um, hard fork that created Bitcoin Cash um, that that's considered a taxable event. So you need to pay tax on that as other income, your Bitcoin Cash. Well, the funny thing is, there was no exchanges anywhere in the world for weeks that were trading Bitcoin Cash. So. Essentially, if you had one Bitcoin, you now have one Bitcoin cash also as a, as a payout on that hard fork. But you have a, a thing that has zero value because there's no marketplace in the world that trades it. But the IRS's ruling says the moment you receive that payout, you need to pay tax on it. So if I put on my tax return that I'm going to pay, let's say my personal tax rate is 25%. Well, it had a zero value. Right, so twenty five percent of zero is still zero, and if I put on there that I had a payout of one Bitcoin Cash, twenty five percent times the zero value is zero, I guarantee you're getting audited, guaranteed. But if you follow exactly the IRS ruling, that's what you should do. But they don't want that. They want you to pay tax on it when the value was realized, which was weeks and weeks later. But that's not in the ruling. So the crypto is such a gray area right now. No, not even the IRS knows how to deal with it. And so a lot of banks are just saying, especially U.S. banks are saying, forget it. We just don't want to touch it. Um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't want anything to do with it. You know, so you got to be careful with that. So you really need to look at banks that are very crypto friendly. Um, and, and there are there are some. I mean, there's 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 quite a few out there. But w when you open the account, that should be if if you're doing crypto anything, you're buying, selling, trading. You know, or maybe you you do some work, you get paid in crypto. That would be one of your first questions you should be discussing with the bank. Do you have any issue whatsoever <clears throat> with um, you know crypto exchange currency? Because you you don't want to end up. Let's say you end up with a hundred Bitcoin, which would be a lot of damn money. But you end up with a hundred Bitcoin and you can't convert it into crypto because you can't find a bank that'll or convert it into fiat because you can't convert it. So that's something you really need to consider. Yeah. All right. Great. Yeah. So if people want to know more about uh, banking options and all that, you can go to the show notes and I'll have a link to that. Um, other than that, all your stuff is at, uh, let's see, um, globalwealthprotection.com, right? And is there any uh, anything else you want to let people know about? No. I mean, it, you know, I mean, they'll, they'll see. They'll, yeah. they'll see our stuff. Like we have our insider membership program. It's just yeah. – internationalize your business, your wealth, and your life. It's just, it's kind of a program with, 
which goes through a lot of internationalization strategies, plus clients get discounts on corporate services and events and stuff like that, plus free consultations. Yeah. But even if you buy the banking report, you get a trial offer on that. You can try it out for seven days for a dollar. <clears throat> so, All right. um, Lots of good information on there. So, uh, yeah, go check that out. And uh, thanks a lot for, for joining me. It was great talking to you. Good talking to you, James. Always a pleasure. All right. We'll talk soon. All right, buddy. Cheers. Thanks for joining us for the Borderless Podcast. Traveling, investing, and living beyond borders.